Welcome to our Profiles and Leadership series. This series offers an unparalleled opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we invite these leaders to reflect on their journey and share skills, core values, and qualities that make them the leaders they are today. I am very pleased today to welcome Judge Diane Wood. Judge Wood has been on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit since 1995, serving as Chief Judge from 2013 to 2020. She is also a Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of Chicago Law School, where she teaches in the areas of federal civil procedure, antitrust law, and international trade and business. Before appointment to the bench, she was the Harold J. and Marion F. Green Professor of International Legal Studies at the University of Chicago Law School, the first woman to hold a name chair at the school. She also served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, with responsibility for the division's international, appellate, and legal policy matters. She is the director of the American Law Institute and the first woman to hold this position. Welcome, Judge Wood. Thank you very much. Thank and you for so, that very nice introduction. And we're so pleased to be the first to be able to interview you for um, in your new position as director of the ALI. Now, I want to start with something that David Levi, the ALI president, said about you in a press release. Uh, he said, we are so pleased that Diane Wood will be our new director and so confident in our future under her leadership. Diane has had a distinguished and storied career committed to the rule of law. From academia to private practice to government service to a time on the court, she's a brilliant legal thinker and has made her mark on many fields, including any trust and international law. She is also a skillful leader and trusted colleague. She has been a forceful and important contributor to the work of the ALI throughout. A membership on the ALI's council for many years as we enter our second century we're so fortunate to be able to work with her as ALI director. I think it's striking that he picked up on your leadership. So let's start with the ALI. Tell us about how you envision your role as director uh, coming into the ALI. It's a tremendous opportunity to be director of the American Law Institute, the ALI, it's, it is, as David indicates, now 100 years old as of February 2023. And throughout that time, it's done several really important things for law in general, primarily American law, although now also um, cooperative efforts with other countries. It began the project of trying to make the law accessible to people, have it make sense through its projects called the restatements of the law, with which anybody who does law is, is familiar these days. And it does it through a very careful and deliberate process that involves input from practicing lawyers, from judges, from legal academics, from people in government service, people with widely ranging views on subject matters, and it does so, believe it or not, even today in an atmosphere of respectful consideration of what the other views are and things in fields as, as diverse as maybe the more famous, the restatements of torts, contracts, property, conflicts, to more recent things, uh, the ongoing work on a restatement of the law of copyright, the very first restatement of the law of American Indians, whatever the field, um, we find common ground. We find black letter propositions that are honestly vetted down to the comma um, by the membership. And the membership as a whole votes in the end uh, on whether this is going to be something that will come out as an ALI product or not. And I think it's this, it's real crucible that things go through that speak for the quality. And when you think about this upcoming centennial celebration in a few weeks, actually, uh, what do you hope that will come out of that meeting? 
We have a number of very special programs planned for that meeting, programs that will be looking at what we can expect to be unfolding in the future. So not that we're the only people doing this, but we are going to have a program looking at artificial intelligence. We're having programs looking at the, the broader scope of law. Have we in the privacy area, for example, come to the point where we really need a global understanding of what is a, a person's individual sphere, what kinds of things can the corporate world monetize and use. So we're looking at all of those things. So I'm hoping that through those programs, people will be inspired to continue coming up with great ideas for worthy topics for the ALI to work on. And we also have some of the Institute's normal work before us where the membership will be considering parts of you know, the law dealing with children or parts of uh, the, the tort law project to see whether we've reached the point of consensus that we strive to, to come to. So I think doing our work, inspiring everyone to continue that work in the future, and also taking a moment to honor some people who have been extremely important to American law in general, not just the American Law Institute. So it, it's, it's gonna be a wonderful event. I wanna talk about um, something that you mentioned in your press release. So you made a point to recognize past directors. Um, when you think about leadership, I think oftentimes people think of the leader standing alone by himself or herself. But in your remarks, you chose to focus particularly on your work uh, in learning from past directors. What was your thinking behind that? I think there's real continuity uh, for one thing. And so each director has had the opportunity to shape the Institute in a way that reflected that person's priorities. I've personally worked with uh, a number of directors going back as far as uh, the late Jeffrey Hazard, a very distinguished professor. Uh, and then after Jeff uh, came Lance Liebman, who was director when I joined the council. So I certainly had wonderful opportunities to work with Lance. Then uh, I happened to be the chair of the nominating committee that recommended Ricky Revez uh, as the director. And to my great delight, Ricky not only agreed to serve, but did serve with great distinction for 10 years until the Biden administration took him away from us and put him at the head of the OIRA office in OMB. And I'm succeeding Ricky. And each of us has brought different things to the, to the task, but they're all important, whether it's particular uh, care with the substance of the projects, whether it's ensuring that we are reaching out and finding all the best people in the country. Sometimes we may not have a lot of members from a particular state, so we need to take extra efforts to make sure we're not overlooking um, a person from, you know, just maybe one of the smaller states. Uh, we don't need everybody to come from San Francisco and Philadelphia and Chicago, you know, and you can I'll throw Boston in there too. So, so each of them has taught me something. And I think, again, given the collaborative nature of the ALI's work, uh, one would be a fool to think that any one individual was going to uh, just sort of be the, the czar of the whole thing, or the tsarina, if you will. Can we expect, under your directorship collaboration with, say, the European Law Institute or Capacity Building in Asia, Absolutely. So we are delighted that a number of members of the European Law Institute are going to be in attendance at the meeting uh, later this month. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them. I've met some of them in person over the years. I've seen others as on the proverbial Zoom screens. So I think that relationship is already off to a great start. And we certainly expect to watch it grow and prosper in the years to come. There isn't right now quite the same kind of entity in Asia, but I'm going to be keeping an eye out for that because as you alluded to, uh, much of my career, I have been concerned about how laws interact from one country to another. 
I don't want to call it just extraterritorial application of the law of A to people in B. It's, it's, it's a much more complicated picture of how we understand the development of rules. Uh, but there is really a, a tremendous opportunity to foster that kind of relationship in Asia, in Africa, you know, in, in, other, in other parts of the world where we have not yet been so active. Talk about the collaboration that the ELI has or might have under your directorship with U.S. institutions like the ABA, like other local associations or regional or state associations. The way we have typically done that, and I think it's actually a very effective way, is the following. So suppose we have, as we do, um, a project on the uh, law of children, children and the law. Uh, what we start by doing is getting the very best reporters that we can find in the country, people who are absolutely expert in this area, and they'll be a lead reporter and typically now a couple of associate reporters. So they're the ones who actually put, if you will, pen to paper, you know, type out on the computer screen, however you want to put it, the proposal for how to organize this law, what the black letter proposition should be, which topics should be covered. But the reporters don't operate in a vacuum. They operate, first of all, with approximately 30 advisors. And in that group of advisors, we'll often have um, other people, liaisons from ABA sections, from social science organizations, if that's appropriate for the field, and it certainly is actually with children in the law, they're child psychologists and child development experts who have very important um, input on what we can actually expect of children at different ages, what kinds of responsibility, what sort of dependence do they have. So through that group of advisors, we really bring in right in, you know, in the room where it happens, if you will, to borrow from Hamilton, uh, we have the right people. We also have a members consultative group now, typically, and that's anybody in the ALI who wants to follow a project. Now that we allow people to participate remotely, uh, the, the, the sky's the limit on how many people we can have. And they'll get the drafts, they'll furnish comments to the reporters. So I think we have procedures in place that are very open to that sort of liaison work, that sort of extra participation that you're talking about. And just on a personal note, as a newly minted member of the ALI, I'm very much looking to my, forward to my first meeting. In Good. Uh, we, we will be <laughs> delighted to have you there. And I think you will be, as I was at my first meeting many years back, so impressed by the care with which each and every member reviews the drafts, the kinds of comments, the way they're able to bring their own expertise in some instances to improve the language. And sometimes, just as importantly, somebody will stand up and say, you know, I don't know anything about the field of X and the law, but I'm a reasonably educated lawyer. This ought to be clear to me. Our audience for restatements especially is non-specialist judges. And so you can't use a lot of jargon. You can't uh, stay inside one little silo. You've got to make those documents accessible to those judges who will be turning to them. So somebody that's been a member of the ALI for many years mentioned um, over lunch to me that the ALI's proceedings uh, in, in some ways almost ritualistic. I think he meant that in a, in a good way. Uh, laudatory way, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, you think about the way that um, emails or uh, work processes go these days. It's somewhat informal. It's somewhat based on efficiency. Is there a purpose and continued importance of having a certain level of decorum, a certain level of ritual in the comment? and consultation process that the ELI has had over the years? There's a great value in the way the ALI has done things. And it's not either or, it's really both and. So I've been following, as we've been getting ready for this annual meeting, the comments that people are filing, the motions they're filing on the various texts that we'll be considering. 
And people certainly, I assure you, people feel free to email, you know, comments, they'll send you a text, they'll, they'll, however they want to tell you about it. We urge them to put it in writing because we take all of these comments very seriously and the reporters need to see them. Sometimes they flag something that's, that's a very valuable contribution and the reporters immediately say, good point, you know, we'll make that adjustment. Sometimes maybe it's a deeper policy difference that deserves some discussion on the floor. It really just depends what it is. But so there's, there's a flood of emails and other kinds of uh, electronic communications. But I think what's important is to get everyone in the room. First, the advisors and the reporters. Then it's actually the reporters and the council, which I haven't mentioned yet, but that plays a very important intermediary role in getting something moved along. And the council members, unlike the advisors who are experts, the council members are the first time the reporters have had to present something to generalists. Everybody in the room may have their own expertise, but as a whole, the council is a generalist body. And they've been through that. And you can just have a very productive back and forth conversation if the person is right there in front of you. And then at the annual meeting to make sure that these are truly institute projects, anybody in the membership who has a point to make walks up to a microphone and the presiding person will say, speaker at microphone two. And the speaker at microphone two will say, I'm Diane Wood from Chicago. You know, I'm looking at section 3.58, line 10, you know, whatever, and I'll and you make your point. There is a clock. I'm very familiar with that as a federal judge. You, you're not supposed to drone on forever, but you need to make your point in about three minutes. And then there's a, a time for some discussion and follow-up. And, and I noticed that was striking to me too when this person related to me, and you just mentioned it. You just if your name. And the city that you're from it's not judge so and so it's not oh. professor so and so uh, and, and is the thinking behind that sort of egalitarianism or something else well i guess you could call it egalitarianism but the people who are in, you know invited to become members of the ali each in their own way are leaders in the legal profession it is a group of you know four to five thousand people who have excelled somehow or another. And in fact, this has been, it's, it's an interesting question because typically if you're looking at lawyers, you're looking at people who either have, you know, if they're in private practice, they are partners in their firms or whatever the equivalent of partnership would be. If they are academics, they have already earned tenure. And so for some topics today, we have the challenge of making sure we get the input from younger people who may not yet have reached that point in their career, and also at the same time, keep up the standards that we have for membership. Uh, and you can do that actually through the advisors. The advisors don't all have to be ALI members. Um, and these liaison groups equally um, may or may not be even lawyers, You know, like the child development specialists. They, they're not lawyers, but they're very important. So I, I think, you know, we all are working together. Nobody's pulling rank on anybody and we're, we're just listening carefully. So this is your first week on the job, so to speak. I want to ask you at the end of it, when you look back, what would you want to say that you've accomplished? Oh, after I finished being director? Um, all organizations you know, need to remain resilient, need, need to have um, a good idea of what their future is. And there are aspects of the ALI that I think will need updating uh, as time goes on. And you know, one could say, do we really wanna spend a decade which is approximately the amount of time it took us to come up with the restatement on the law of American Indians, doing something, are there some topics at least that need <clears throat> a faster process? Uh, and I don't mean precipitous, but you know, a decade's a long time. You know, faster could just mean three years, right? So, so we might need to find more flexible ways of addressing topics. We might. One of the longstanding issues is 
to what extent do we confine ourselves to traditional common law sorts of subjects? And to what extent do we look at subjects that are interspersed with statutory law? The copyright project is a good example of that. Obviously, there's a Copyright Act. Nothing that we say is going to change the fact there's a Copyright Act. But like many American laws, the courts have elaborated on important parts of the Copyright Act. And to that extent, it's judge-made law. And so finding that line and finding where it is we really should just not jump into the pool and, and when should we is interesting. And we've had this traditional distinction among restatements of the law, primarily directed to courts, principles of the law, which is the sort of thing we might do in a less developed area. And there's a little more freedom for reporters in a principles project to indicate what they think the best rule is. That's not what's happening with restatements. Restatements really just have to tell you what it is. You might like that rule, you may not like that rule, but if that's the rule that the courts are following, that's the rule that you are going to faithfully restate. So you have principles, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the model penal code. Uh, we don't have a lot of model codes, but that one has been a very important thing. With the uniform law commissioners, the ALI is responsible for the uniform commercial code. Uh, that's been a great partnership over many, many years, and we look forward to that continuing. So I think all of these things are, are different. And as I'm director, I want to make sure that we are focusing our attention in the in the most productive possible place. And are you going to be the, well, I should say, are you the first judge who is now director? Has there been judges before? No, I looked into this actually, because I'm, for this first year that I'm director, I am going to continue as a senior judge on the Seventh Circuit. At that point, I'm going to retire from the judiciary and I'll just, I won't be a judge anymore. I'll just be a retired judge. There was a Judge Goodrich from the Third Circuit who was director of the ALI during the 1950s, I think late 40s to maybe 1961 or something in that region. And he served for quite a while, actually. It was a time before we had some of the ethics rules that we now have in place. And so I guess it wasn't quite as um, important for him to observe the lines that I'll be observing, but he, he was. So I think I'm the second one. So let's talk about you as a judge and leadership in particular. You wrote an article called When to Hold, When to Fold, and When to Reshuffle the Art of Decision Making on a Multi-Member Court. Uh, and in that article, no spoilers, you talk about dissents, why it's important to dissent, what type of dissents there are. Um, and when you were appointed, the press when they wrote about you, they described you as a counterweight to the conservative forces on the court, in particular, Judge Posner, Judge Easterbrook. I think it's notable that one woman, liberal judge, was sufficient to counterbalance <laughs> two conservative male judges. Uh, I don't know if the irony was lost on them. But Judge Posner had... Uh, was quoted as giving you advice saying that being on the court is like an arranged marriage without divorce. And so you had to pick your battles, you had to learn to compromise. Um, reflect now on your experience on the court and in particular in writing dissents and tease out for us some leadership lessons. Sure. Well, the first thing I mean, it's kind of evident on its face. The Seventh Circuit, when I joined it, and it still is a court with 11 authorized spots. Sometimes we've been full. We don't happen to be right now. There's one empty slot that, that's awaiting a, a nominee. When I was chief judge, it got down to seven people. Never mind if it's even 11 people. This is a small number of people. You're sitting there in panels of three. And certainly the first thing that I really took to heart. And I relied on the experience of the judges for whom I had clerked, Irvin Goldberg of the Fifth Circuit and Harry Blackman at the Supreme Court. You go into every case with an open mind and you assume that your colleagues are doing the same thing. Because if you assume that you know how they're going to vote on every case, 
you're going to be wrong a certain number of a certain amount of time. And so I absolutely thought you had to keep an open mind. You had to be the best prepared person in the room because there's nothing like having a full command of the facts and the law to allow you to make respectful but strong arguments for the position that you're looking for. So that's what I did. I mean, actually, Judge Posner and Judge Easterbrook, each in their own way, have been friends of mine for years, and, and I thoroughly enjoyed my colleagueship with both of them. So I don't want anybody to think this was some you know, adversarial situation. We certainly had our disagreements sometimes, but there would be times I would, let's say, Judge Posner, you know, I would write a bunch of comments on a draft that he had proposed, and he would come right back at me and say, you know, I really like the following comments, and I'm going to adopt them, and maybe there's some others that I'm not going to, but here's my reason. It, it was a very productive, academic-like, if you will, exchange of views, and I always felt welcome to express whatever it was I thought. Absolutely the same thing with Judge Easterbrook. He and I have been friends since 1979. You know, it's a, it's a long time. And our friendship does not depend on seeing exactly eye to eye in every case. Although, as I pointed out in that article, at the Court of Appeals level, agreement is much, much more common than disagreement. And my explanation for that is that at the Court of Appeals level, our jurisdiction is mandatory. Somebody just has to pay $505 and they can take an appeal, whether the case is hard, easy, or anywhere in between. And so most of the time, I don't care which of my colleagues it is, any three of us on the court are going to decide the case the same way because there's the law out there. People forget that. There is law that is telling us what to do. Of course, there are the hard cases. And my estimate in that article at the Court of Appeals level, and I looked at a number of sources, is that's approximately 3% of the time. That's not that much. It's a tenth of what you see at the Supreme Court. But why is that? Because the Supreme Court is taking six to 7,000 cases and cherry picking the 65 or 70 hardest, most important cases out of that pool. And I promise you, if you have the hardest, most important cases, it shouldn't be shocking that reasonable people might have different views on them. One of the reasons they take a case is because there's a conflict in the circuits. And it doesn't mean that one circuit wasn't doing their job right and the other circuit was. It means it's a hard question. So I thought it was important to highlight that um, fact about the separate opinion writing phenomenon at the Court of Appeals level. I counted up my own cases, and I was about there. So yes, they, they tend to be pretty important cases. And when I've written dissents, sometimes the Supreme Court has taken them and, and gone my way, and sometimes they've not, you know, but it's, it's very important to have that debate out there. Right, and, and I think it is also notable that in 2017, the the scent that you wrote in the sexual orientation uh, Title Seven case was actually upheld. Uh, it wasn't a it, dissent. It, it, no, well, they, no. They, they followed. No, no, it wasn't. That's right. It's you were writing for the majority, and it was I wrote for the and bank majority in that yeah. case. And, 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 and therefore, it wasn't like with the great dissenter of the Seventh Circuit. Well, in one case, you did dissent. That, that was the case involving the mezuzah. Uh, yes. And uh, Judge Easterbrook uh, was. In the majority, when he went on bank, actually changed his mind. Now, tell us about how that that persuasion took place. Well, it's what I said. Um, I can think of a, a number of cases that the same sort of thing happened. But the first thing you have to do is respect the good faith of the judge who didn't happen to agree with you. He had reasons for seeing both the record and the law the way he did in the mezuzah case, block against Frischholz. And, you know, I had my reasons, but you can do a deeper dive into the record. You can look to see why maybe a fact that 
somebody relied on had other aspects to it, put it in context. Um, is a mezuzah the same thing as putting, um, you know, a, a poster for Taylor Swift on, on the door? Um, well, they're both something on the door, so maybe they're a little bit like that, but a mezuzah is a very important religious um, piece, you know, I, I, I want to say a religious element. It's, it's, it's something that an observant Jew is commanded to put on their doorframe, and jokes to one side, a Taylor Swift poster is not, you know, and so the, the religious overlay turned out to be important. There were also other legal issues in that case that Judge Easterbrook, to his tremendous credit, you know, was happy to keep an open mind on, had to do with whether the Fair Housing Act protects only the transaction of obtaining housing, whether it's a lease, whether it's a, a purchase, or if instead the Fair Housing Act really protects your rights against discrimination during the whole time you occupy the housing, if it's something like a lease or a condo or something where it's not just you know a separate uh, entities out there, a separate house out in the suburbs or something. Even that, it could come up. You could have a homeowners association. So anyway, we found that it that it actually applied to the full duration of your occupancy in the housing. And it's just meticulously putting those arguments together, showing how what may have seemed like a good analogy really had more aspects to it than was first apparent. Obviously, you have new arguments too. You know, at the in bank level, you've had another round of argument. Very distinguished lawyer uh, presented the argument for the family at the in bank level. And some facts came out that I think were very powerful that perhaps the lawyers hadn't highlighted as much as they might have done in the briefs. So you work with what you have, but if you're working on the merits with the facts and with the law, people will listen to you. So to your mind, it wasn't even a close case. No, I didn't think so. Not from the start. Were you surprised when Judge Easterbrook changed his mind? Um, be a little bit. I mean, you know, I. It, it's hard to say because. Well, it doesn't happen often, though, that a judge. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. I, mean, I don't change my mind himself. often. I don't change my mind often either. So, I mean, I'm just like, and any of us, once we've done all the work on a case, you know, are pretty confident that we've done the right thing. There are hard cases where you might be on the fence, and you finally have to decide. It's one of the things I love about being a judge. You don't get to say, "Oh, what an interesting question." you have to decide, you know, you win, you lose. And it's a great challenge sometimes. So as a result of that case, and I think just your general reputation record up to that point, commentators, including Tom Goldstein, uh, noted how you were able to build relationships, keep the respect of your colleagues, uh, and how you were well poised to be that consensus builder that the Supreme Court needed, to be, a, first of all, an intellectual counterbalance on the Supreme Court against uh, Chief Justice Roberts, but also like uh, Justice Stevens, to be a consensus builder and to be able to convince swing voters like Justice Kennedy to come onto the side of the liberals uh, in, in the voting process. Do you see that dynamic existing in the court today? Do we need a consensus builder in the Supreme Court? It's very hard to say because the, the, the way the press covers the Supreme Court is very much like, you know, team A and team B. And so who has switched over for a particular case? The picture can be more complicated. And typically the longer a justice serves on the court, the more that justice becomes comfortable with his or her own approach to the job. And I think they become in time, usually, maybe not always, but a lot of people become in time much harder uh, to pigeonhole into one box or another. You mentioned Justice Stevens, you mentioned Justice Kennedy. I think both of them were clearly, when all was said and done, Justice O'Connor, the same thing. They were people who voted the way they thought they should vote, you know, and sometimes it fit the press's idea of team A and team B, and sometimes it didn't, but that they did 
exercise their own independent judgment. And that's, that's of course, what we want from everybody on the court. So you once described, uh, you like Venn diagrams. Mm -hmm. and, I do. I love and, and you talk about the Venn diagram of judicial philosophy and politics. Uh, in a way, I think recognizing the reality that you can't completely separate the two. How does that, you think, play out in the courts? Um, it's much more complicated than the press would have it. I would certainly, I mean, if you're implying that you think there's a pretty strong correlation, oftentimes, between a certain judicial philosophy and you know, whether somebody punches the Republican button when they go in a voting booth or the, the Democratic button. Um, yeah, there probably is. I, it, it's not, again, it's, it's not immovable though. And it really depends so much on, on what's going on. There, there definitely are people who traditionally have thought that the courts should do less, not more. You're familiar with books, The Least Dangerous Branch. You want to make sure the courts who are unelected aren't getting out in front of the population in ways that the democratic process can't address. Uh, Justice Breyer wrote an interesting book about this, kind of when in doubt, leave it to Congress, because even if we've gotten wrong, even if we've gotten it wrong, Congress can fix it. And I like that philosophy very much. Sometimes it's been espoused more vigorously by what you might think of as more conservative from a political point of view people. Sometimes it's been espoused more vigorously from people who tend to have a political liberal orientation. But I, what I hope for always is consistency of approach to the judicial job. You know, are you, again, on this, when in doubt, defer to the elected branches, school of thought, you don't want to put an asterisk on it, except when I don't like the result. I mean, you know, you, you have to be principled in this in order for people in the country to have faith in the judiciary as a whole. And I worry that people are losing that faith. If you look at polls that are taken, um, I think it, it's, it's, a very, it's very easy to lose trust and it's very hard to build it up. And it's our responsibility as judges to build it up however we can. So when you came up, not once but twice, under consideration for the Supreme Court, the Republicans were against you and the press identified your view on abortion rights as being that prime lightning rod. Uh, do you think it was a view, the perception of the view rather by the Republicans that was blown out of proportion? Um, and unfairly politicized. So if you had that Venn diagram analogy again, that was that 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 politics part that was taking over overshadowing the judicial philosophy and the merits of the person uh, part of the well, there, there was certainly some, I guess, oversimplification. So there was one case they really didn't like, which was about abortion protesters. But what they people protesting outside abortion clinics. But what they, they clearly hadn't read the opinion because what I had said at the very beginning of the opinion is if the only thing these protesters were doing was marching around outside the clinic with big signs that said, you know, pro-life messages, I said, we wouldn't be here. What the protesters were doing, which I outlined in the opinion, is they were throwing people through plate glass windows, attacking women so violently that their stitches from surgery were bursting open and they were having to be rushed off to the hospital and rampaging through the facility, destroying equipment as they did so. And so I said that violence of that sort is not the kind of protest that the First Amendment protects. Um, I don't want to be thrown through a plate glass window. I'm sure you don't either. It's a very dangerous thing to do to somebody. So if they had focused on that, I, I kind of, I don't know how you explain it better, but it was really interesting. One of, the, one of the amicus briefs in that case was filed by people for the ethical treatment of animals. And they were worried about what the proper limits on public protest are. Can you go if you don't think people should have furs and 
hurl a big can of red dye at them. I mean, that's that's what some people did. So anyway, I regretted that, that they weren't looking more carefully at the actual facts of what I had actually done. And the other, other thing that's too bad in a way is, is just there's a principle here that the abortion case, you know, now overruled, but, 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 but the Roe versus Wade had depended on. And that principle is that there are certain areas of personal life that no matter what level of government, whether it's a city, a state, the federal government, any other level you can think of, are simply not touchable. So to take the easy example, there's Loving versus Virginia. The state has no role in telling you who you can marry. Uh, you can't have laws that say interracial marriage is unlawful because who you decide to marry, and I'm gonna keep it just with a monogamous relationship. Maybe it's a slightly different issue with polygamy, but it's a highly personal decision and you don't want the federal government, the state government, the local government, anybody doing that. There were other cases from the early 20th century, Pierce against Society of Sisters being one of them, Myers versus Nebraska being the other, um, that said another one of those core rights is how do you educate your children? If you want your children to go to a school where the German language is being taught, then that's a personal decision. It's not for the state to interfere. Um, and so the abortion cases, the contraception cases fell in that line of cases. And if you wanted, as the Justice Alito opinion does in Dobbs to say that this isn't, part of the federal constitution, then you need to be willing to throw away all those other cases too. You really can't be selective and say, well, it's okay for this, but it's not okay for that. And this is again, my, my hope that we as judges are deciding things on a principled basis, not on a, um, a basis that's overly influenced by the subject matter of what's going on before us. And, and, and what can judges do to draw that balance? What I think needs to be done, and a lot of people are trying very hard to do this. I certainly try very hard to do it, but I think opinions are critically important and you wanna make sure that the final version of your opinion that goes out is not in the slightest bit tainted by ad hominem arguments, that is not tainted by um, the kind of argument that says only an idiot would think this, you know, sort of thing. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, you want to be respectful on both sides and explain to the public what fundamental legal principle brought you to the decision you came to. And, you know, leave, leave the color for somebody else. There are going to be plenty of people in the press writing about things. There'll be plenty of academics who can flame all they want, you know, but you as a judge need to show the public that you are following a rule of law. So Zachary Clapton, I think, uh, picked up on that. You must have left an impression. Uh, My he, former clerk, yes, wonderful person. He, and, and now at Northwestern, I think, yes. mentioned uh, writing an article about you entitled A True Friend, and I'll put in the video description a link to all these um, articles that I'm mentioning so our viewers can actually uh, enjoy them as much as I did looking at them. Uh, described you as follows, your writing with and your judgeship as, with intellectual humility uh, in a way that is uncommon among those with lifetime appointees. Uh, how do you stay humble? How do I do what? How do you stay humble? Oh, <laughs> I am one person, right? And I'm on a multi-member court. My colleagues have good ideas every day. And I think it's actually also important to stay grounded in your community, in your society. You know, I am a mother of three, a stepmother of three, a grandmother of three, almost four. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not just a judge. I am a citizen of this country and I have great respect for the other citizens of this country. And that I think is 
is something that keeps you grounded. You can't you can't take yourself too seriously if you're if you're racing away from the courthouse and bouncing around with your seven month old grandson to make sure he's feeling okay. So would you would it be fair to characterize that as being um, your lesson in leadership from your family, not to take yourself too seriously? Oh, definitely. You know, I learned from my mother and father. Um, the critical importance of treating everybody with respect. It didn't matter if it was the person coming to clean the office or if it was the chief justice of the United States or if it was anybody in between. They're all people and you need to be courteous to all of them. It, sh it should just be second nature. And you know, I would like to think that that was a lesson that I absorbed. And as chief judge, what would you say your lessons or takeaways were from the your time as chief judge? Right. It was a challenging time to be chief judge because the government shut down three times. And so I was trying to help us all navigate the both the legal and the practical complexities of that situation. But maybe my most important job in the end was, as is true under the statutes that govern um, all of the courts except the Supreme Court, the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, the chief judge of the circuit is the initial reviewer of all complaints of either judicial misconduct among anybody who's a judge, a magistrate judge, a bankruptcy judge, a district court judge, a court of appeals judge it, within the circuit. So quite a few judges, not just the seven circuit judges. So you're the first reviewer. Maybe it's misconduct in one case, Sometimes it was disability, you know, where you began to get some word that a person um, was forgetting things or falling asleep in the bench or maybe displaying signs of, of um, cognitive dementia. I mean, nobody's fault. I mean, this is just the human condition, but you have to do something about it. So I navigated that. Most of the complaints were of, of no merit and, you know, you write a brief order explaining why, but some of them were serious. And so if they're serious, you constitute a committee, you let the committee investigate it, figure out what to do. There's a judicial conference committee also on codes of conduct and the circuit level report is submitted to um, the, the judicial conference level committee. So again, this is part of maintaining confidence in the judiciary. If we can't self-police, then people can rightly complain. But we, I certainly took this responsibility very seriously and did everything I could to fulfill it. Right. So right now we do have um, lifetime appointments. All judges are, enjoy lifetime appointments. Therefore, it seems to me the presumption would be that as long as the judge is able to subject to the measures that you just described, uh, perform her job to be able to continue to do so, regardless of that person's age. Has it seemed, does it seem to you now that the burden of proof has shifted to that the judge, once the judge reaches a certain age to show that he or she can perform the job? And the older the judge becomes, the heavier the burden seems to be. I'm not sure I would say that because there's another feature of the system that's important and I'm taking advantage of, of this feature. Because of the provisions of article three, which permit actually literally service during your good behavior, which we interpret optimistically to mean lifetime. Um, and it usually is. So Congress doesn't have sticks, but it does have carrots. And so, Part of the system allows any judge who meets what's called the rule of 80. And what that means is you have to reach the age of 65. That's non-waivable. But if once you hit the age of 65, if you have 15 years of judicial service so that your age plus your years of service equals 80, you may, if you wish, take senior status on the court. And that creates a vacancy, which the president can then fill with a new judge. Now, the difference is, as a senior judge, you are subject to being certified by the chief judge of the circuit. So one of the things I did as chief judge was look at all the applications from the senior judges, again, district judges, court of appeals judges, and I would evaluate whether this judge 
had it in them to continue sitting? If so, was 100% load enough if that's what they wanted? Or was this somebody who really should be at a lesser load, 50%? There's a lot of give and take uh, for that senior judge certification process. But you can continue as a senior judge as long as the chief judge is willing to certify you. And that's a very important power. So there have been senior judges well into their 90s and the chief judge might think, well, you're up to a 30% load, but, and, and maybe all civil, I'm not gonna put you on criminal cases anymore or, or whatever the chief judge works out with that person. But the ultimate power to certify is in the chief judge. And if the chief judge thinks you're just not up to it anymore, the chief judge won't certify. Might be a little right. up. So, so therein lies the catch of an active judge becomes a senior judge, then the call becomes, the ball goes to the court of the chief judge. Uh, that, that's right. Assuming a collegial, collegial and respectful relationship arrived, it can exist, that system works. But oh, otherwise, yeah. for active judge, the only, only um, protection that she might have is remaining active. Right, I mean, if you, if you want it, many people, choose to stay active for a very long time. It, it just, it's an entirely personal decision. I thought that it would be nice to have the extra flexibility for myself that being a senior judge would give me. So I submitted a letter to the president um, in November of 2021, announcing that upon the confirmation of my successor, I would take senior status my successor was nominated and confirmed. So in September um, of 2022, actually not even a year ago, I took senior status. Now, the fact that I'm a senior judge is what makes the ALI directorship possible. It's exactly what I was hoping. I'm Not that I was hoping to become ALI director, but just the idea of a little more flexibility in what I was doing with my time was very attractive to me. I'm still sitting with the court this coming year, starting you know, July 1st, uh, I'm going to take a reduced load down to 60% because there are only 24 hours in a day. And so I need a little bit of time, uh, more time to be able to attend to the ALI, but it, it's very exciting. And, and um, so, so that's, that's the advantage of being a senior judge. Some people don't wanna do it. You know, one of my colleagues says that that person is never gonna take senior status and that's, it's a totally personal decision. For the active judges though, you don't have as many tools on the conduct and disability. Um, so that requires a, a finer touch. Thanks. I see my video was frozen. Your video was frozen. Yes, I could see that. I can hear you fine. Okay. Well, the important thing is that folks can see you. We're coming up against the hour. I do have a few more questions uh, to run by you. May I ask them? Certainly. Yeah, that's fine. So in, in an uh, article, you were not interviewed, but you were the interviewer. It's uh, shortlisted women in the shadows of the Supreme Court. Tell us about your experience and your takeaways uh, from interviewing the authors of the book. Right. I, I highly recommend the book. It's called Shortlisted. It's by Renee Nate Jefferson and Hannah, I'm forgetting her last name. But anyway, um, it's about the practice that happened for a very long time of including names on a so-called short list really for more political reasons, not because this person was actually going to be put on the Supreme Court. But Renee and Hannah became very interested in who these women were. And so they went back and did very thorough um, examinations of what their careers had been, where they were. They were very impressive people, people who should not be forgotten. Some names you might remember, Amalia Kearse, for example, was a very distinguished judge in the Second Circuit. Uh, and, and there were some others, but some of them, at least I had never heard of them at all. And it was a lot of fun to read about their background and to realize, frankly, what a rich pool of women had been around for a long time. Now they cut off their consideration. Uh, so they didn't go into anything past Sandra Day O'Connor because of course, Justice O'Connor wasn't just shortlisted. Justice O'Connor was in fact named and served on the Supreme Court. And 
you are you are also known as the rock star of the written word. <laughs> um, when you are up for nominations, people marvel at how you were able to to write in a way which I think uh, the man on the street understood. You quoted from Shakespeare, um, the case of the, about the mezuzah. You talked about you quoted from the Merchant of Venice. Uh, talk to us about the importance of communicating clearly and effectively. There is nothing more important for lawyers than to be able to communicate clearly and effectively, both orally and in particular in writing. In many circuits, not the Seventh Circuit quite so much, but in many circuits, your chance of getting oral argument is very small. Uh, maybe six to 8% of the cases will, will get oral argument maybe if they're really crazy 10, but you know, in our case, it's closer to 38%, but you are gonna to need to get your point across when the judge sits down and reads what you've submitted. So, and, and actually at the other end of the process, when I'm writing an opinion, I want people to understand why the case came out the way it did. And maybe I come to this as somebody with a great love of, of writing and literature. I. Um, roughly, I would say, did a comparative literature undergraduate work. I almost went to graduate school in comparative literature and then the last second decided to go to law school. Um, I love words. I love, you know, in some future life, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to like <laughs> read things and, and, and write. Um, so I, I'll do all kinds of things. I'll read what I've written out loud and I'll think, would anybody say this? You know, it, it, it kind of gets you away from lengthy sentences with lots of dependent clauses. It gets you away from clumsy or antiquated use of words. And the other thing I really try to do is I try to make the words do the work for me. I try not to begin with, you know, the, the fact of the matter is blah, 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 you know, just sort of filler words. I try to come in with a powerful, you know, accurate verb or noun that'll show what it is we're doing. And, you know, I, your transition should be easy. Uh, I mean, I love writing. It's something that I think is very important and it makes all the difference in getting your point across. And Richard Epstein called it your counterpunch. Uh, I think that was <laughs> particularly evident when you used um, the inept analogy, I think that the, the plaintiff in the Mezuzah case did in, in quoting the pound of flesh against um <laughs> that was crazy yes i mean it was it was in a um in a supplemental filing and i pointed out that this was a well-known phrase from the merchant of venice i will invite you after we're finished to just go on google and write pound of flesh and see what the first thing that comes up is. It's going to be Shakespeare, the Merchant of Venice. And if you actually went in, as I did, and looked at the scene where Portia says this and where it's being discussed, it's actually a very troublesome scene in the play. Uh, she's being very punitive towards Shylock exclusively because he's Jewish. And it's there's just so much more to it. I was accused of being a pointy head when I put that in, but I didn't mind. Well, it certainly left an impression. I think it, it shows the power, not just of words, but be able to connect these concepts in an impactful way. Uh, when you talk about writings, can we expect a memoir or a book of new things <laughs> from you at some point? Now that you've got more time on your hands. Right. Not, not immediately. Maybe eventually. One of my neighbors keeps telling me I should write something. So if he, if he succeeds in persuading me. Right now I'm working on an article uh, in my academic capacity down at the University of Chicago on um, what's, what's wrong with qualified immunity law. Uh, and this is something that I've seen a great deal of over many years in the judiciary, 28 years. Uh, so that's, that's my current project. Now, in addition to your mastery of the written word, you are also a master of music. So you play the <laughs> oboe and the French horn. Uh, or rather the English horn. English horn, yeah. Right, uh, with orchestras and with a band. Tell us what your experience with music has taught you about leadership. 
Well, I love my music. We have a concert coming up in which we're doing Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony and the Beethoven Mass in C major. So it's going to be a great concert. As a musician in an orchestra, I mean, one could be a solo musician too, but as a musician in an orchestra, what you have to have, the sine qua non, is perfect cooperation among everybody. You've got a conductor, but everyone's got to play their part. If it's a time for a little oboe solo in the middle of it, I've got to come right out with the, the little oboe solo. But a lot of the time you're supporting or you're providing harmony, and it is the ultimate collaborative effort. And I think it um, it shows that that's that there's something powerful, something bigger than any one person alone can come out if you can cooperate in that way with other people. And I what's, love the music anyway. And what's, what's the favorite piece that you've performed, either in orchestra or in a band oh, or by yourself? Very hard to say, but, but one real high point was when my orchestra was playing the Dvorak New World Symphony, and I was covering the English horn part for that. And there is a beautiful English horn solo that begins the second movement of that symphony. It's really the second movement is all about the English horn. And it was a real treat uh, to be able to perform that. Last question about mentors and mentees. Who would you regard as the significant mentors in your life? And what does mentoring look like to you? Well, there were a lot of people who were um, very important in my life. Certainly the two judges that I worked for with whom I kept up a, a very uh, wonderful friendship after I left their chambers taught me more than I could possibly say about not just the law, but how to be you know, an, an effective and ethical and committed lawyer. Um, People I knew at the law firm where I practiced, Covington, uh, again, were extremely influential. And one in particular I think of who really showed me you don't need to be obnoxious you know, to be an effective lawyer. This man never raised his voice. He was the consummate gentleman. He was one of the most successful lawyers in the firm. I mean, just everyone looked up to him. And the idea that courtesy and effectiveness are quite compatible with each other really stuck with me for, for years. So many people at the law school, you know, more senior members of the faculty, I think of the late David Curry, I think of, you know, uh, the late Paul Bator, but peers as well. Jeff Stone was always wonderful to me and he remains a great, a good friend to this day. Um, and then on the court, Lots of people, Alana Rovner took me under her wing the minute I came here and she is still an extremely valuable colleague and it's, it's always great to be with her. So I've had a lot in terms of mentoring very quickly. I try very hard both with my former clerks and also the many law students I've had the pleasure of teaching over the years to be available for them if I can help them in any way I do. Oh, what a pleasure it's been, Judge Wood. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us your thoughts on leadership. And on behalf of our viewers, I want to wish you a very successful and impactful um, next chapter as director of the American Law Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl.